Yeah, hello. Uh, as I was already introduced, I'm Martin Lenders and I uh, will talk about securing name resolution in the Internet of Things, uh, specifically DNS over Coop, a work I did with Christian, Jenk, Marcin, uh, Thomas and Matthias. And first I will give a brief, um, give our motivation um, why we want to do DNS over Coop, then give a brief introduction into the protocol Coop itself. Then give some of the design guidances we used from IoT DNS traffic, like name length and uh, record, uh, record types, uh, to design DNS over Coop, which I then will uh, be presenting. Uh, then give you our evaluation of DNS over Coop and some further improvements that we did to DNS over Coop itself later on. Um, and then conclude my talk and uh, give some future work uh, that we will do. So first, our motivation is, of course, we want to do name resolution in the Internet on, of Things. And typically, your IoT device then just sends a DNS request, for example, for what a record and something like this of a name. And then you get a DNS response back. The problem, however, is if you have some evil eavesdropper that uh, then can gather information from this DNS resolution and, for example, here, look up some vulnerability in some publicly access accessible uh, vulnerability ta database and uh, then for, uh, uh, put some malware on the IoT device and then control our IoT device, which, of course, is bad because we know already that some IoT devices were uh, involved in past DDoS attacks. So a countermeasure to that is, of course, to encrypt the name resolution um, against eavesdropping and uh, making the eavesdropper very sad. So uh, the challenge, however, is that we are working with constraint devices. So we are not working with voice assistant or smart fridges or not even the Raspberry Pi. We are working with nodes that only have a few kilobytes of RAM and ROM. So your Arduinos, your ESP32s or your feather, Adafruit feathers. And we're not working with Wi-Fi, we're working with constraint networks, which are characterized by low throughput, high packet loss, and isometric link characteristics, which means that we have high penalties on large packets. What do I mean by that? Well, if I take a large packet um, and we want to send it to another device, we have to fragment it and send it fragment by fragment, oftentimes without any recovery, and then reassemble it at the end. And what if we lose a fragment? Well, then we lose the whole datagram. And given that we have such constraints in our uh, uh, networks, we really, really don't want to do that. Uh, especially have a look here at the lower one column where we have uh, orders of magnitude slower data rates than Wi-Fi 6 and also very small packet sizes. So we want to avoid fragmentation as, as much as possible. We can't avoid it at all, but we want to avoid it as much as possible. So what possible solutions are there to encrypt DNS? There are, of course, DNS over HTTPS and DNS over TLS. Recently, DNS over Quick was added. And there is also DNS over DTLS, which is a datagram-based version of DNS over TLS. And um, the problem with those is that DNS over HTTPS and TLS are both based on TCP, which conflicts with our resource constraints. DNS over uh, UDP also uses TLS, uh, which also conflicts with our resource constraints. And DNS over DTLS has no segmentation uh, scheme, so it conflicts with our constraint link layer PDUs. So our proposal is to do everything over Coop, which provides us with uh, encrypted communication based on DTLS or OSCOR. And it provides us with blockwise message transfer, which then provides the message segmentation we need. And it also has onward caching to mitigate high link layer packet loss. And we and, and in the end, we can also share system resources with co-op uh, uh, with co-op applications that we might have on the device. So we can use the same sockets, the same buffer to save the RAM. And we can even reuse a co-op retransmission mechanism to save ROM. Um, so what is Coop? Um, for those, it, probably many of you don't know this protocol. Coop is a constraint uh, application protocol which was uh, standardized by the IETF. 
It is basically REST over UDP, which means it's the HTTP for the IoT. And it works just like you would expect from HTTP, uh, having, some, for example, GET requests to get a temperature resource. Uh, you can even define some, for example, a unit with a query parameter and then get the temperature back as a content response. And you can also uh, change resources, for example, with POST uh, by manipulating a light resource, in, for example, and get a change response back. Uh, Co-op comes with two security modes. There, first, there is uh, Datagram Transport Layer Security, which is basically TLS over UDP. The problem with that is, however, if you send your data over an encrypted transport, if you have it at a gateway or even at some unencrypted channel, you, of course, lose all your confidentiality. Uh, so for Co-op, because it's very proxy heavy, um, there was also uh, OSCO designed, which is object security for constrained and restful environments. And there you basically encrypt the whole uh, object. So you are safe on both encrypted channels, gateways and unencrypted channels. Um, it also comes with caching, um, both on an, uh, the client node and also on proxy nodes. And basically, it works similarly how you would expect it from HTTP. When you get a larger resource, you uh, can define a max age and a, an entity tag, and then store this in your cache. And then you can fetch that information from the cache again, even when you later send another GET request to that resource. But what if uh, the information is stalled? Stalled? Staled, sorry. Um, then uh, the cache can add the entity tag to the uh, request, and then uh, the server just sends a valid response back without any payload, so saving us a lot of bandwidth. Um, and then basically the cache entry can be restored, uh, setting the new max age and then getting the content from the cache. But uh, important to note, this is orthogonal to DNS caching. So if you want to do DNS over co-op, you have basically another layer of caching to handle, deal with. So um, what name lengths are there on the IoT at the moment? What uh, DNS records are there? And is this information important for the design of DNS over co-op? Uh, this is what we do in the next question. For that, we looked at three IoT data sets, your things, IoT Finder and Mon IoTR. All three were collected throughout 2019. They contained DNS and MDNS traffic for DNS service discovery from 90 consumer devices from 50 vendors and uh, contained uh, 200,000 uh, queries and 1.3 million responses, uh, each for 2,336 unique queried names. And we also have uh, compared this to an IXP data set, which uh, was collected at the Central European IXP to have some comparison to general internet traffic. This one was collected in January 2022. It is DNS only and is was uh, sampled at a rate of one over 16,000 packets and contains 1.6 million queries, 2.4 million responses. And uh, we can't say anything about the uniqueness of the names because they were anonymized to their lengths, because that's the first thing we looked at, the name lengths. And you see here on the left side, a uh, normalized histogram for both the IoT data and the IXP data, and then also the name uh, statistical key properties of the name length in the table on the right side. And if you look at the uh, uh, histograms already, and also if you look at the statistical key properties on the right, you see that um, Basically, the data is very similar, but if we look in more into the extremes, you see also this high peak there around 24, um, but also in the minimums and maximums, we see that uh, the IoT names actually are a little bit longer than the general internet traffic, uh, which comes uh, mostly because they typically uh, request names for cloud services and CDNs, which take a form, for example, as with this Akamai name. Um, but in general, they are very similar to the internet names. So we don't have to account that much for that in DNS over uh, co-op. Same goes for the queried record types, because in all of the data sets, we saw mainly address resolution. And of course, with MDNS and DNS service discovery, we saw some service discovery. But also on the IXB, we saw some service binding information exchanged. So 
Uh, our conclusion is that uh, A and Quad A record uh, resolution is prevalent also in the IoT. And uh, even with when we take a group OSCOR into account, which is a technology to encrypt multicast messages, uh, we can might even have a solution for uh, encrypted DNS service discovery. And uh, something that I didn't show on this slide, um, because I only talked about queried record types, but there are also a lot of unsolicited NS records in the responses, which increase the response sizes, which should, of course, be avoided with DNS over co-op. So how does DNS co over co-op now work? Um, I said that uh, uh, co-op is basically the HTTP for the IoT. So should we just map DNS over HTTP and use the GET and POST methods as proposed in the RFC there? Well, the problem with that is that the GET uh, uh, method is cacheable, but the application data is carried in a query parameter, not in the application uh, in, in the body of the uh, uh, query, which means we can't blockwise transfer the queries. Um, and while we can do that with POST, um, there the responses aren't cacheable. But in co-op, there's something that is the best of both worlds, uh, which is fetch. And um, this offers both uh, response caching and uh, the ability to carry the application data in the body. So if we do DNS over co-op, we basically just put our uh, co-op query into a fetch response, which has a content format application DNS minus message which then is taken out of the uh, uh, DNS uh, of the co-op query and uh, put on the general DNS infrastructure, which then can use whatever uh, DNS transfer protocol you like. And we get the response back and then put the response into a 204 uh, content response uh, message with a content format again, application DNS minus message. So uh, we then evaluated our data there are protocols, sorry. Um, and for that, we let uh, two clients send uh, 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 and query for records with name length 24, uh, which was a median in our IoT data set, um, and did this over DNS over UDP, DNS over DTLS, co-op in an unencrypted manner, uh, co-op over DTLS and uh, OSCOR. And we uh, queried for 50A and 50 quad A records each, uh, which was the most in our IoT data set. And uh, we sent out the queries in a Poisson distributed manner with a lambda of five queries per second. So very, very fast. And um, we did uh, 10 runs on uh, the IoT nodes of the IoT lab. So real hardware, which are Cortex M3 nodes um, with 800 radios. So we then looked at the resolution times. Uh, here you can see the CDFs for that, uh, which, uh, which uh, with, with the resolution time, of course, on the x-axis and the CDF on the y-axis. And we can see that there are three clear performance groups. In red, we have UDP for the A records. Um, for the quad A records, we also have uh, this second group and also with co-op, uh, post and fetch. And all the rest, especially the encrypted protocols, we have group three. So the question is, where do these performance groups come from? Well, for that, we have to look at the packet sizes. And uh, there we can clearly see that the first group is basically all the messages that don't uh, get fragmented, um, those query and response. Uh, in the second group, only the query is unfragmented, but the response is fragmented. And in the third performance group, we have both messages fragmented, um, which means that, uh, good news, we only, only the fragmentation has an impact or a larger impact on the performance compared to, for example, the transfer protocol used or the co-op method used. So we can say that DNS over co-op is on par with existing uh, DNS over UDP solutions. But when we look at the memory consumption, so the build sizes, uh, we can see here the ROM size on the top uh, and the RAM build size on the bottom, uh, be, uh, both noted on the y axis in uh, kilobytes. And on the x axis, you see the transports. First, we can look at the RAM, which even for uh, even if it's a tiny advantage, we see that uh, uh, with DNS over OSCO, there is a little advantage over DTL DNS over DTLS. 
And um, if we look at the ROM usage, we see a clear advantage of the encrypted solution. So DNS over DTLS, DNS over co-ops and DNS over OSCOR, where we uh, see that uh, OSCOR is basically having the smallest ROM size. And that is because it only uses 50% of what DTLS is using for its ROM because uh, it doesn't provide any uh, additional message exchange, for example, to for session establishment, because it just assumes that the uh, keys are somehow pre-shared or use a key exchange protocol, which is also built upon all, uh, co-op. And all the co-op uh, message exchange happens in co-op, so uh, we can save a lot of RAM by using DNS over OSCOR. Yeah, and I summarized this on uh, this part of the slide again. So, uh, and uh, just to give a note, um, Yep, uh, we can also, of course, uh, abstract the option handling a bit to get a little bit more ROM advantage out of the DNS over OS co-op implementation itself. So how to improve this further? Um, we uh, can look at the name length again and there uh, look just at the minimum that we saw in our IoT data set. Uh, there, if we put this in a typical uh, six low pan message, um, I, typical I say because it, there can of course be smaller uh, six low pan headers, but we see here already that uh, the packet is seven bytes too long for the link layer PDU of 802.15.4, which means we get fragmentation. And as I said in the beginning, fragmentation comes at high cost, high penalties. So. How can we avoid that? Well, we designed a new DNS message format, with, which is basically based on CBOR. So it is a concise message format, and it is defined as a media type and a content format. So you can both use it both with DNS over co-op and DNS over HTTPS. Um, it uh, uses CBOR to get the message smaller in the first place, but then we also omit redundant fields in DNS um, to um, to get the message even smaller. And then we also provide optional address and name compression with the CBOR packed format. So in, to look at this a little bit uh, as a teaser, um, you can see here what uh, messages we base, uh, what part of the message we basically put into DNS over plus CBOR and which part we can left out because it's at least for the DNS over co-op client redundant information. And with that, we reduce the message size by over a half and basically uh, prevent fragmentation. Um, so to conclude my talk, um, security and privacy friendly is ready for the constraint IoT when using DNS over co-op with Fetch, which provides encrypted, uh, cacheable and segment segmentable DNS. It's on par with resolution in resolution time with existing UDP-based transfer protocols and OSCOR outperforms detail S and co-ops in both packet and memory size. Uh, for future work, we want to specify and evaluate the concise DNS message format more. Uh, uh, you can see there also is an internet draft um, and uh, look into the potential of MDNS protection using group OSCOR. So if you want to reproduce our research, we also uh, published our artifacts for that on Zenodo and GitHub. And if you want to look into our standardization process of that protocol, you can have a look into the data tracker of the ITF. Uh, hi, uh, thank you for the nice talk. Um, I have one question. So if I understood it correctly, you used in the evaluation uh, the domain names of length 24 characters. Yes, but at, so, at exactly 24. At exactly 24. Yeah. So, so why do you then sometimes see fragmentation for queries and sometimes you don't see those that fragmentation? Because the uh, transfer protocol adds extra overhead by its headers. So, um, if you have, for example, the uh, uh, key information in there and with detail S or uh, uh, the state information with OSCOR, uh, then you get just bigger messages. Okay, and then another question. Um, would this work with DNSSEC? And if so, how, or would, it, would the DNSSEC validation be done it, it on would, the server? But the problem with DNSSEC is because of all the key information that needs to be exchanged with that, you get the large messages. So if we find a compression scheme for the key information, then it might, but uh, at the moment, we recommend in our draft to just use uh, con uh, the, the authentication of OSCOR and just trust your doc server. 
Um, so yeah, but uh, it might. We are currently also looking into DNS OSEC uh, over OSCO, uh, over Core. Yeah. Thank you. Other questions. So one question that I have to, uh, as you mentioned, it is there's now a draft for the ITF, yeah. and but you mentioned uh, a bit earlier that there were already a few standards. So can you please just identify um, what was the starting point for uh, this work? I mean, was there already some DNS for a uh, co-op, or is that the first work to um, explore that? At least. Publicly, to my knowledge, there wasn't any work on DNS over co-op, so we looked into the other protocols if they work for our use case, but um, as I mentioned earlier, they have come with their own problem for the constraint environment, so that is why we started the work on DNS over co-op. Thank you. Any other questions? Okay, so let's thank the speaker. Thank you very much, Martin. Thank you. Thank you very much for the introduction. So, yeah, my co-authors and I, we investigated the performance of post-quantum TLS. So let's start with the post-quantum aspect. So it's basically all about these quantum computers that got more and more attention in recent years because they got more and more powerful. And they, well, coming in these fancy looking contraptions you can see here on the right sometimes, that you could say that they change the rules of the game because they are computers, but they work fundamentally different to our normal computers, which means they can solve some mathematical problems very efficiently that our normal computers cannot. This means, like the, the, the problem of this is that our, the foundation of our modern cryptography is such a problem, which means that as soon as more powerful quantum computers are available, they will break our traditional asymmetric cryptography. There are, of course, already solutions out there, and these are these novel post-quantum crypto algorithms that have been proposed and that at least claim to be resilient against quantum computers. <clears throat> to even boosten this development of these novel algorithms, actually at the moment NIST, so the National Institute of Standards and Technology, is running a competition where researchers can submit their own algorithms and get a chance to be standardized. You might ask yourself, why should we care about this? It's a good point, because we are here on the left, so there are no powerful quantum computers available yet that threaten our secure communication by breaking the encryption. However, there is the threat of these store now decrypt later attacks. Basically, where an attacker just stores traffic now and decrypts it as soon as powerful quantum computers are available. So this basically means we should do something now. So we should make our com communication, for example, via TLS, post-quantum safe as soon as possible, or ideally yesterday already. And we asked ourselves now, what happens if we do so? So what are the performance implications? And this is also the reason why we collaborated with Nokia, because they asked it the same questions themselves. So what happens if they apply these novel algorithms in their networks? To better understand this problem, you have to know, well, what's quite obvious is that uh, if you use post-quantum crypto with TLS, well, it changes the costs on the CPU. Some algorithms are more efficient and some more expensive as traditional algorithms. And they actually all increase the amount of data that is exchanged. However, networks are complex. We have hardware, libraries, we have the TCP stack, we have TLS, etc. And we wanted to measure now the effects or the implications on the performance if we combine both. Okay, so how do we measure the performance of TLS? Or let's have a look at the setup. So we used a client and a server that were connected via a glass fiber cable. And on both machines, we ran the post quantum safe OpenSSL from the Open Quantum Safe project. However, we wanted to measure the performance without interfering with our own measurement. Imagine you're running TCP dump on one of the machines. Well, of course, it takes up CPU time, so it interferes with the measurement. So we used the third node, the timestamper, that used optical splitters 
on the connections to uh, capture the whole traffic. Okay, and sometimes we, for some of our measurements, we additionally use NetM to emulate different constrained network scenarios like a low bandwidth, having a high delay, etc. So NetM is basically a Linux tool for network emulation. Then our whole setup, of course, looked more like this. And if you're interested in the hardware details, we have listed them there. Okay, so now we know how we measure. The only question left is what should we actually measure? For this, you have to know that TLS is designed completely independent of the underlying crypto. So basically, we don't need a new protocol. We only need to negotiate different algorithms. And the second thing is that asymmetric cryptography is actually only used in initial handshake. So we only need to evaluate the initial handshake. Okay, so have a look, so have a look at the handshake. Well, it starts with the client, sending a client hello to the server. And a server reads it and it responds with the server hello. These two messages are actually already enough to perform the key agreement that is uh, to encrypt the rest of the communication. If you're using a post-quantum key agreement, well, of course, these two messages are already affected. Then the server continues with additional messages. Important ones are the certificate and a certificate verify message because they to authenticate the server to the client. If you're using uh, with, with, with digital signatures, if you're using post quantum signature algorithms, of course, these mes messages are affected as well. Then the handshake is finished from the server and only the client needs to send his finished message as well. What you might notice here is that we have several messages that are unencrypted, which is great because we can use them to measure the duration of the whole handshake and act from the timestamp perspective without decrypting the traffic. And we can actually measure two parts of the handshake, the first one from the client hello to server hello, and the second part from the server hello to the client finished message. All right, the only thing left to, to is uh, what algorithms should we now investigate? And for this, I've listed here the, the currently relevant algorithms. These are Crystal Skyber for a key agreement and Crystal's Dilithium Falcon Sphinx for uh, signature algorithms. So these are relevant because NIST, they are kind of early winners in the NIST competition because NIST already announced they will standardize these four algorithms. Although Sphinx is very resource expensive, so we don't think it will be that relevant for TLS. So NIST also said they will standardize more algorithms um, and at least Spike and HQC are still in the competition. So we have six algorithms to evaluate. And we always compare them to the state of the art we're using right now, which is elliptic curve to the Hellman for the key agreement and RSA for the digital signatures. Okay, let's get to some results. And I'm not going to show you all of our results, just four key insights that we have learned and find quite interesting. First one is how the latency can be influenced in the, um, by the message handling of OpenSSL. Second one is about low bandwidth environments where the large post-quantum key sizes become a bottleneck. Third one is how the one RTT TLS handshake can actually take up several round trip times. And lastly, that in the right conditions, post-quantum TLS is fast. Okay, let's get to the first insight. So we basically got this by analyzing different combinations of key agreements and signature algorithms. And then we noticed that some were faster than we would have expected. This was strange because it kind of created a bias in our me measurements. So we investigated and found, like, let's have a look at and found the following. So sometimes we observed this behavior of a TLS handshake, it's basically a sequence diagram. It again starts with the client hello, is sent to the server. Then the server does some computation regarding the key agreement, then does some computation regarding the signatures. <clears throat> and then after finishing all the computation would send everything, the, the messages back to the client. Also the client will start his computation of the key agreement already after receiving the server hello. The strange thing was sometimes we observed a different pattern and that looked like this. So it would start with the client hello again, server computes the, the Cree agreement, but now the server would immediately send back the server hello and only then compute the rest of the handshake and send the certificates and the signatures in a separate 
message. Not big difference, but you can see that the write version is slightly faster. So we looked into this, why this happened, and it was actually due to an internal buffer of the OpenSSL library that the developers use of 4096 bytes. And whenever the TLS messages would exceed this buffer, the content was flushed and the content included the server hello, which then improved actually the latency. Now, the thing is with these post quantum algorithms, they were quite large with the key sizes. So this, let's say early server hello, happened actually quite often. As said before, this created a bias in our measurements. So to actually get consistent results, we modified the OpenSSL libraries to flush the server hello directly after computation, which actually improved the latency of all combinations. Okay, let's get to the second insight. It's about low bandwidth environments. And for this, I just present you some results. So we, we use this table format and you can see here on the left, the security level of the algorithm. So arguments are available on different security levels from one to five that were defined by NIST. Although not each algorithm is available on each level. Then you see the key agreement we use, the signature algorithm, and here we basically evaluate our A, Falcon, and Dilithium. Now, if we have no emulation, you can see that they are more or less the same. The handshake latency is more or less the same. They're all fast, although Dilithium is the fastest algorithm here. Now, we added a low bandwidth on our on our link, in this case, one megabit per second. And here you can see that suddenly the latency uh, got worse a lot. However, the lithium is now suddenly the slowest algorithm. Why did this happen? Well, let's look at the amount of data that is exchanged and that reveals that gives us the answer. So RSA is very efficient, just two kilobyte of data in a whole handshake. However, the post quantum algorithms are much more expensive, the lithium here being the most expensive. Okay, third insight is about one RDT handshakes. And for this, I'm going to just so show you some results again. Just this time, we focus on key agreements, so the Kyber and HQC key agreement, and the high delay scenario we emul emulated. So we configured basically a whole second for the round trip time between client and server. And here you see that the first four algorithms well took one second for the whole handshake as expected. However, HQC took two. Why? For this to understand, you have to keep in mind that TLS handshakes are at least usually directly after the TCP handshake. So TCP is still at the slow start minimum, which is, depending a bit on the operation system, um, 10 MMS. For Ethernet, that's 15 kilobyte. And if we have a look at the amount of data that is sent by the server, well, HQC, HQC just surpasses this 15 kilobyte with adds additional round trip time. So if you configure these arguments on your server, you have to keep that in mind, especially if you're also using uh, post-quantum signature algorithms that also, of course, uh, increase this. All right, the, fast, the last insight is about uh, that they can actually be quite fast. So again, let's have a look. So here we see all our key agreements that we ever evaluated. The top row is basically the state of the art baseline we have, X25519 elliptic curve algorithm. And then we evaluated Bike, HQC, and Kyber, the post quantum algorithms. On the right side, you see the handshake latency. And it, you see they are all fast, which is really great. Only Bike is a bit, little bit slower. If we're going to the signature algorithms, you see that Falcon and Dilithium are even faster than RSA. If you go to level five, it's even more interesting because, well, the only traditional algorithm that fulfills security level five is the elliptic curve P521. And you see it gets very expensive. And the uh, post quantum algorithms actually are almost as fast as on level one. Okay, with this, I come to the end. Uh, so, very good news. You see that uh, post quantum safe TLS is possible. A fast post quantum safe. Um, however, sometimes it's kind of a trade off between CPU and bandwidth. 
Then we saw several performance tuning factors. And if I could interest you in post-quantum TLS, we have several additional findings in our paper, um, more algorithms, more variants. We actually found that there is no drawback in using hybrid algorithms. Then we have some white box measurements, some algorithm recommendations, and finally, we also open sourced all our scripts and code that you can find in the paper or in the link. Thank you. Thank you very much. Questions? Any questions? So, given that we have the time, can you please go back one, two slides and explain again how you do the magic so that it can be faster? <laughs> um, so, how? Well, basically, here you use the measurement with no constraints on the links. So having a high bandwidth is really uh, a necessity. So yeah, if you're not limited by bandwidth, the only limiting factor is CPU. And here the post quantum algorithms are actually better than the ones we use today. Yeah, but that's the, and of course, if you have a limit on the bandwidth, you have to consider the algorithm. So for example, Falcon is more it's more CPU intensive, at least a little bit. However, it uses less data in the handshake. So at least if you're limited in bandwidth, Falcon might be a better choice than the lithium. So just to continue on this question, so assuming that you know you are still limited by bandwidth and maybe not one megabit, but you have a bit more than that. So if if you looked on the uh, when we looked on a few slides before that, you have shown, for example, that some of uh, the algorithms, yeah, exactly that. So HQC required 16 kilobyte versus three kilobyte for a uh, Kyber, but it required only twice the time. So it's not that it's linear with the amount of data exchanged. So what will be the optimal choice here because this is not a linear connection? So in this case, if you would configure the, the initial congestion window to a bit more than 16 kilobyte, it would also take just uh, one round of time. Okay. Okay. But Any other question? Yes. Maybe it's not working. So if you go back to the previous slide, uh, I was just wondering what could just be the impact of uh, packet loss? What is your expectation here? Because since the message is bigger, you will suffer more packet loss probability at the end, and this will, will you try to do any measurement on the impact of packet loss? Um, we didn't measure the, the impact, but of course, if you the, the messages are huge, <laughs> so you have much more packets, and then of course, a packet loss has an increased impact. Um, actually, that's a bit wrong. In the pa our paper, we did evaluate packet loss, and it sometimes increased uh, the, the latency, like at least by random, a lot. Yeah. So of course, then we have an additional amount of time to get to the messages. Dovetailing a little bit with the previous talk, um, the IoT devices being resource constrained, did you check to um, look at the uh, power overheads of these new post cryptum techniques, the you know the energy consumption overheads, and if not, uh, that's cool. But uh, do you have an intuition uh, how those power overheads might be? Um, good question. So we did perform some white box evaluations where we looked on the machines and kind of computed them in CPU costs and really depends on the algorithm but at least the ones i showed you here they are very efficient in the cpu that's why they were so fast basically and we were always cpu limited in our measurements unless we uh, configured uh, yeah one of these constraint network scenarios so for example sphinx is incredible expensive on the cpu so it took several seconds for the whole handshake to complete uh, compared to the few milliseconds for the other algorithms. 
כן. אוקיי, okay, thank you very much, let's thank the speaker again. Thank you for the introduction. So, yeah, let's start it. So, today, uh, internet users are exposed to unprecedented levels of surveillance, tracking, and monitoring, uh, which are carried out by um, usually governments and um, companies or even other third parties. And um, one of the tools that, or one of the systems that um, users rely on to protect their online activities are anonymity systems. Uh, one popular anonymity system is Tor. And basically, um, these tools allow users to um, navigate uh, the internet uh, in such a way that they keep their online activities secure. Uh, for instance, um, here we have an example of uh, Alice. She's a journalist and she's using the Tor network to browse a given page. Uh, Tor actually creates a circuit based on three, three relays so that no relay knows simultaneously Alice IP and Alice destination. So one crucial property of these systems is uh, make sure that an attacker cannot um, link the source with the destination, otherwise we are basically revealing um, Alice and her destination page. Um, however, um, due to um, the advances in traffic analysis attacks, uh, providing unlinkability uh, is extremely difficult today. For instance, an attacker can monitor uh, the traffic that goes into the, not into the network with the traffic that goes out of the network and use basically distinctive features to basically um, identify that Alice is accessing a given page. So how can we actually provide unlinkability under these conditions? Well, we have this uh, three lemma. Ideally, we want to provide all of these three properties, so strong anonymity, high throughput, and low latency, but unfortunately, we can only pick two. So we explore the system that offers strong anonymity and low latency. And basically, to this end, we propose the new uh, primitive, which we called KFunnel. And the idea uh, is to offer K anonymity uh, to a group of K clients. So K anonymity, uh, it's not new. It has been used quite a lot uh, in message-based anonymity systems, such as TASP and Buddies. However, bringing that K anonymity uh, into low latency systems, into uh, circuit-based anonymous communication systems, uh, poses non-trivial challenges. First, we have the low latency requirement, and second, we also uh, have synchronization problems. And our primitive here uh, allows um, clients to gently, uh, jointly tunnel their traffic to a common proxy, or we call it bridge. And also, uh, we ensure that the traffic from all of the clients remain uh, indistinguishable from uh, one another. So that um, even if an attacker monitors both ends of um, of the communication, you won't be able to um, identify the users. So uh, the system requirements here, and basically contrary to message-based systems, we need to ensure that all participants um, are online. And um, also we need to ensure that the, the um, all participants cover each other's network accesses. Uh, secondly, we need to ensure that the traffic from all of the clients are basically the same, share the same properties. Again, if we look at message-based systems, we can delay or even um, buffer messages. We cannot do it that in these uh, systems. And third, we uh, also want to be protected or our users to be protected against the disclosure. disclosure. So over time, um, an attacker can actually infer which users is more likely to access a given page. Uh, to this end, we actually uh, deployed, uh, designed and deployed a Brick, and Brick is a pluggable transport for Tor. And the really cool thing about being a pluggable transport for Tor is that you don't need to change any Tor protocols, so you can attach Brick to a currently uh, to a current Tor um, application, and you are able to use the system. Also, we incorporate uh, multiple defense mechanisms against traffic analysis. So uh, we have a protocol that we design to make sure that um, the synchronization between clients, uh, the bridges, and the Tor network uh, are done. 
Uh, we also guarantee uh, traffic shaping techniques, again, to make sure that the traffic is indistinguishable, indistinguishable from all of the clients. And finally, we also have dedicated mechanisms um, to monitor the exposure against statistical disclosure. Uh, first, I, I want to show uh, or explain uh, what's the use case for Brick. And the idea is that Brick is supposed to be used by smaller user groups in democratic countries that are usually target of mass surveillance. Uh, Brick is to be deployed by uh, independently by a trusted organization. And I actually uh, brought an example here. So we have uh, KFunnel with uh, three users. We have the two main components. So we have the hub, which is the client part of the system. And we have the bridge, which is the server part of the system. And in this case, uh, Alice and Bob are actually connected to the system and browsing the web to different pages over two different Tor circuits that only share the first relay, the bridge. Charlie, on the other hand, uh, is not online, but has left his device connected in order to support the system. So the first requirement. Um, how our thread model is basically, so uh, how does our, our attacker look like? First and foremost, the goal is always breaking the unlinkability, trace uh, the, um, the users back to the destination page. And so we consider that our attacker has global um, or state level capabilities, means that they basically can look the entire path, the entire network path between the hubs and the destination. But it can also deploy um, active attacks. And with active attacks, I mean uh, delaying or dropping uh, packages in order to. Uh, try to extract relevant information. And we don't consider that the attacker uses auxiliary data, means that, for instance, if Alice is located in France and someone is accessing a French uh, page, uh, yeah, we don't assume that the attacker uses that information. Out of the scope are uh, side channel attacks to the server, to the bridge, and also uh, malicious uh, operators. So we incorporated four main defense mechanisms that I will explain a bit more in detail in the next four slides. Uh, but basically, we have synchronization uh, attacks, so um, defense against synchronization attacks. Basically, uh, whenever we open a circuit or close a circuit um, that may reveal information to an attacker, we have traffic confirmation attacks, again, uh, trying to ex um, expose users by looking at the traffic, in this, looking at the distinctions between the traffic. Statistical disclosure um, over the long run, uh, making sure that uh, we cannot or the attacker cannot really extract um, or predict which users is accessing which page. And finally, breach hijacking attacks in which um, the attacker tries to gain admin privileges on the server in order to basically dump or read the content memory of the process in order to see which ones are which clients are really opening circuits from the ones that are just supporting the network um, apart from all of this uh, we use a common traffic shape uh, operations so basically we um, have and send fixed size packages we call it frames we send them at a predefined rate and whenever no data is available which was the case the case of charlie a couple of slides ago we just send shaft data so dummy data so uh, the first attack, so basically synchronization attacks, uh, our defense against this is we require that hubs, the client part, specify a k-min. And basically this k-min value is the number of hubs that need to be connected simultaneously to the same uh, bridge. So for instance, if Alice specifies a k-min of three, it means that another two hubs need to be simultaneously connected in order for Alice to open a circuit to the Tor network. Okay, uh, now that we have seen uh, how the system works um, and we know that we are sending a fixed size package at a predefined rate, one trivial attack that an attacker may do is basically drop or delay package from one of the hubs at a time. And by doing that, it would reveal uh, the same pattern in the egress flow. What we do here is we actually have a throughput leveling mechanism on the bridge that ensures that um, all the traffic is basically throttled. So we wait for a frame from all of the hubs before delivering content to the Tor network. So basically defeating this type of attacks. Uh, regarding statistical disclosure, um, 
you can think of a case where, let's say, um, an attacker uh, starts to guess that every time that Alice is online, uh, there is always an access to a given page. So over time, you may start to notice that probably is Alex that uh, Alice that is accessing that page. And for this, we actually um, propose a system uh, using rounds. Each round has a period of time. And we have also two main components, an Oracle function and a policy. And basically, the way this works is every time that a new round starts, it means that the previous round has finished. So the bridge performs statistical disclosure attacks using all of the information from the pre previous round. And basically, um, it passes that output to a given policy, and then the policy decides, OK, um, Alice is probably exposed to a statistical disclosure, so we should notify Alice that she should enter a shaft only mode. So do not open any Tor circuits for a couple of rounds, but still keep the keep her hub connected to the um, to the bridge. And yeah, basically um, a couple of rounds later, when it's safe again, Alex Alice can then um, start nor or open new Tor circuits to the network. Uh, the fourth attack, basically a uh, breach hijacking attacks, is basically uh, the case where someone could gain admin permissions to the breach. And if you think that someone can actually dump or read the content of the memory of the server, then it's trivial to identify which users are connected from the ones that are just sending shaf. And we tested this. We ran uh, the server under a trusted execution environment. We used Intel SGX. And the idea here is that all uh, reads and writes to memory are encrypted at the hardware level. So, um, yeah, basically dumping the process memory won't reveal any information in this case. So how do, did we test this? So basically we deployed nine Raspberry Pis uh, among different uh, households. And uh, our first experiment was try to understand what's the raw throughput and latency of these devices because they were using different ISPs. And as you can see here, um, the throughput of these devices ranged between 17 and more than 200 megabytes per second, and the latency between 40 milliseconds and more than 100 milliseconds. But if you look at the plot on the right, you see that over the course of six days, the throughput of our system is rather stable. Well, except for that dip between day one and day two, where basically the Raspberry Pi operator home network was significantly overloaded during that time. Um, we also wanted to stress test our prototype. So we also run um, the same throughput and latency experiments over up to 25 um, clients. We did it over 10 runs. So we used um, iPerf to measure the throughput and HTTP to measure the latency. And we use two different configurations. So you see on the green, the data, and you see the chaff. And basically the data means that all 25 clients are really opening Tor circuits to the Tor network. And the same configuration for chaff means that they are just supporting, they are just connecting to the bridge without opening any uh, Tor circuits to the network. As you can see there, um, the throughput is between two and seven megabytes per second. And the latency uh, tends to increase uh, when the number of connected clients also increases. This is ex expected since um, the, with a higher number of connected clients, you need to wait for more frames before delivering the content to the Tor network. So that's the reason. Also, one thing that I want to point out is there are a lot of variability in this data, as you can see here, but that's not exclusive to our prototype. You can see on the blue line, which has the vanilla tar, um, you have also the same variability. So this is actually the way um, Tor network or and the differences between the relays on the Tor network. So uh, second question uh, or second experiments that we did was basically answer um, our main question was, can we actually correlate traffic? Like, can we actually correlate what goes into the network with that with what goes out? And to this, we used uh, Deep Coffee. So Deep Coffee is a deep learning end-to-end uh, -end, um, correlation traffic relation system. So we actually repeat the same experiments that the original authors uh, did for uh, Vanilla Tor. We did it under two different uh, brick configurations. So same frame, but different um, 
frequency of transmission. So we built a data set of um, ingress and egress, covering uh, basically Alexa top 20, 20k websites. And as you can see there, um, deep coffee cannot really correlate uh, brick traffic. So for both configurations, the values are really close um, to the random guess. We also wanted to test um, our throughput leveling mechanism, and basically we wanted to test um, what information does it look like to our attacker. So as you can see here, we um, did a small experiment with two users, and Alice and Bob here are uploading a file over the Tor network. And what we did was uh, an attacker basically drops Bob's traffic for short periods of time, around instance 51, as you can see there, uh, when the red line dips. And if I was an attacker, I would look at there and see, OK, the blue uh, line, which shows the traffic that goes from the bridge to the Tor network, has to belong to Alice because I dropped Bob's packages. This without the throughput leveling mechanism. However, if we turn on the throughput leveling mechanism, you see that uh, the same experiment does not reveal anything to the attacker. Uh, regarding uh, statistical disclosure attacks, uh, we uh, made a theoretical um, experimentation. So we consider uh, an unlikely scenario, and that scenario was that for some reason um, a hub would not send either SHAF or real data, and for some another unknown reason the bridge would not pick this failure. So uh, as you can see here, um, we consider also a user which in the first plot has a probability of um, fail 10% of the time for a couple of rounds, mainly 365 rounds. And you see that uh, the difference between the real probability distribution of the user and the one that is inferred by an attacker in the first case uh, is just 0 0.09, assuming that the, that user fails 10% of the time. If, however, that the same user fails just 1% of the time, that value, that difference between the real and the one that is inferred by an attacker is 0.19. And if uh, this, that same user fails just 0.1% of the time, that value increases even more to 0.35. So this allows us to conclude that um, Brick uh, is still vulnerable for, uh, to statistical disclosure attacks if we consider um, apps with lower uptimes. But for our 99.9 .9 uptime deployment, we consider Brick to be uh, resistant. Um, also, if we consider um, 99.999, so three nines, this attack fails entirely. So uh, the takeaways from this presentation, what I want you to take away from here, is basically that Tor is vulnerable to traffic correlation attacks. So a global passive adversary can still uh, correlate uh, the traffic and de-anonymize users. We introduced a new uh, K-funnel. So basically bringing K-anonymity from message-based systems to circuit-based systems. We designed and, de and implemented Brick. Uh, it's open source. You can check that out. Uh, as a pluggable transport for Tor. So no need to change Tor protocols. You can use it uh, right, right from today. And yeah, we um, implement implemented several traffic correlations and statistical disclosure um, defenses. And in the end, basically, we uh, provide strong anonymity and low latency while offering uh, reasonable throughput. Thank you so much. Yeah. Thanks. So thanks for the presentation. One, one clarification, if you go mm -hmm. to the throttling uh, uh, countermeasure, mm -hmm. say if you go back to your, to your slides. Which one, sorry? Uh, the throttling uh, for the rate of a user, you know, Alice and Bob, so yeah, the next one, this one. This one? Mm -hmm. So for instance, you see that even with throughput leveling, mm -hmm. uh, Alice uh, is slightly later to react. Mm -hmm. What if I can keep doing this uh, 10 times? I have a very, um small you know signal that they can reliably infer and so on. Mm, so your question is about so i'm blocking bob i see i see that this is blocked but it's blocked with a delay 
I'm mm -hmm. doing this 10 times in a row. I'm pretty sure that uh, Alice, that is. Mm, not really, because um, the, traf uh, the attacker looks at the blue traffic, so the traffic that goes from the bridge to the Tor network. But actually, if you guarantee that um, you have the same, let's say, the same properties, Alice stops sending traffic and sends just chaff. So what I'm seeing, what I'm telling here is that Alice and Bob, the information that you have here, um, like you need to know that the users are uh, sending traffic or not. So the attacker only has access to the raw traffic. It does not tell if Alice is sending chaff or if Alice is sending real data. Not, not sure if I answer your question. Nice, nice talk, actually. Um, just one clarification as well. If you go back to slide 13, I guess. Uh, 13? Yeah. Here, mm -hmm. yeah. Here you assume the attacker is dropping packets. Mm -hmm. What if the attacker can mark the flow of packets from Alice by sending duplicate packets or marking packets with IP ID, Alice, 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 and then on the exit, it will see packets from Alice, 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 mm. Alice. Will this work or, or not? And how does the attacker mark the packages? Rewrite the header. Mm. No. Or inject uh, duplicate packets. Yeah, that wouldn't work because first the traffic is encrypted, so that would probably disrupt the TLS. At the AP level, mm, that wouldn't work. So basically, he, like the traffic that goes from the from Alice uh, to the bridge, so it's encrypted, and then we have basically a um, throughput me throughput leveling mechanism. So we wait for a frame from all of the hubs to deliver that to the to the network. What you could do basically is to drop package um, to a certain extent in order to basically denial of service the system. That is one of the attacks that is possible and vulnerable. OK, OK. OK, well, let's thank our speaker. Oh, hello. Good morning or almost good afternoon, everyone. So this work was uh, done by by my student um, and I and Okay, let's go. It's about um, an attempt to explore the use of natural language processing in the context of DDoS. So volumetric den distributed denial of service attacks is, is, a, is an old problem. It's been there in any, any other class of cybersecurity attack. So uh, this, for example, has been a, a paper uh, like a early 2000. And uh, but the even though it's an old problem, it keeps getting worse and worse. Like uh, uh, the, the attacks are at larger volumes or, or like uh, cause more damage and um, it doesn't seem to stop. And and actually it won't go away. There's no solution that is, is, is going to actually magically kill the problem because attackers continue to improve their strategies to cause more damage like uh, new forms of amplification, new vectors, and so on. So the outline of this presentation is, uh, I'll first um, discuss a little bit about what is DDoS characterization, so which is different from attack identification. Then um, I'll discuss uh, the problem with data sets, because in, in studying um, uh, cybersecurity problems, specifically DDoS, uh, we miss good data sets and we miss uh, good labeled data sets. So the things we have are usually uh, created in tiny lab networks and, and this is very different from the internet. So then I'll demonstrate the, uh, what we explored in using natural language processing for, for DDoS and call this DDoS to VEC. And um, we evaluate this in two ways. One is using one month of IXP traffic or flow records, and then we analyze uh, longitudinally um, uh, one year of uh, IXP traffic to see transferability. So let's contrast attack identification with characterization. 
So blocking a DDoS attack um, traffic requires identification capabilities. And this is different from understanding a DDoS attack traffic because that requires characterization capabilities. So to illustrate this better, let's consider um, uh, these this different steps. So let's suppose there is a DDoS attack. And the question is, can I detect the attack traffic? If I cannot, well, the attack will continue. If I can, then the question is, can I separate the attack traffic? And if no, then maybe I use black holing, like a kind of a, a will discard um, everything that is that is um, addressed to, to some, some server or some network, which is coarse grained. But if I can separate the attack traffic, then the question is, can I learn something from the attack traffic? And if I if I cannot, then I will use filtering. And but if I can, then I, this would allow us to improve our filtering process by leveraging new knowledge, like understanding better the attacks and and like um, comparing them and and learning and and then uh, perfecting uh, these these mitigations. To accomplish this study, um, we need the data sets. So like uh, before characterizing any uh, DDoS event, uh, we need a realistic network traffic data set having sufficient data, like not, not like a one day or one week. We need a lot more and we need a lot of, 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 of packets or, or flows. And this has to be kind of realistic. And also uh, we would like to have or we need a set of ground truth or labels describing the characteristics so that um, um, because um, this is not only um, the uh, attacks but perhaps there is kind of um, uh, different attacks and there is benign benign traffic together so we need labels to identify which is which and specify so we look at uh, several data sets that we find um, in, in in many papers on, on the literature, on DDoS literature. And the, the first three ones are quite old, um, like 2007, 99, the KDD, you know, kind of everyone knows by now that we should not use this. And the other three ones are, are, are recent, kind of common in, 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 in some uh, uh, DDoS papers. And um, then we, started analyzing the content of these data sets and it was quite clear that these data sets were not very good. Uh, they contained a lot of problems. And uh, uh, then we used the SIG DDoS 2019 just to illustrate the magnitude of the problems or how unrealistic the results that are based on data sets are. You know, the, the, those kind of uh, very good machine learning performance that are based on these data sets. So, and why? Okay, unrealistic and unknown attack configurations. So, for example, this uh, data set, the SIG DDoS 2019, it has flows labeled as DR DOS uh, DNS, like a distributed reflected uh, DOS attack using DNS as a vector. So uh, compiling some statistics from, from the data set, like uh, we see like uh, the, the use of ports, um, source port, destination ports, or most common port pairs. And then the question is, uh, first, I mean, even before ports, which stage of this uh, of reflection is this? Is pre-amplification or, or pre-reflection or post-reflection? So that makes a difference in terms of, of, of ports. Why is port 53, which would be DNS, uh, largely absent? So if this is a DNS attack, DNS would be should be quite prevalent there, but it's not. And what DNS requests were sent to the reflector? Because, well, depending on the kind of uh, request, um, um, kind of it changes the, the, the size of the response and so on. Unrealistic network environment scale because uh, these data sets, they, they were created artificially in a small lab network. So the number of communicating hosts could fit into a slash 27 prefix, which is very small. I mean, if you think about a real DDoS attack, there'll be 
perhaps thousands of machines sending sending uh, attack, not like a not small one. Traffic rates uh, are very low, uh, maybe because they they want to provide packet captures. And uh, there's a very weak diversity in terms of attackers, like hardly distributed uh, DOS. So there are other concerns that we do not report, such as UDP flows uh, being marked as a sync fluid attack. Uh, clearly not the case, but uh, kind of we needed an alternative. So uh, we had access to um, uh, IXP uh, flow records. Uh, it's a private uh, uh, data set from 2019. It's a bit old now. It's the sample rate is one to 4K. Uh, this is a medium uh, medium sized IXP, like more than 200 um, networks on it. And well, it represents uh, real world traffic. So um, in this plot, we see just the number, the number of flow records that we see like uh, every every week. Um, the order of several uh, hundreds of millions. Uh, so, to obtain ground truth, uh, I mean, we okay, we have this IXP uh, flow record data set, but we don't have labels. I mean, this is kind of benign, mostly with with weird attacks included, but uh, these are not labeled. So, what do we do to solve this problem? We leveraged uh, a recent publication, which is IXP Scrubber. Um, that and and they used um, um, black holing. I mean, a strategy to collect traffic that had been black holed, and they mined rules such as the one being presented there with protocol, port, source port, destination port, packet size, and a level of confidence. And by using these rules, what we did, um, even though they were UDP only, uh, what we did is that we apply. This, this, these rules to our IXP data set to say, to label the data set. Okay, this flow record is benign, this flow record is malicious, depending on the, I mean, every every um, flow record that matched um, this this uh, rule like this, or, or many of the other IXP scrubber rules that would be malicious. So um, now, how to use natural language processing so, because we were inspired by the dark um, dark back work that was published in Connext uh, by Marco uh, uh, not long ago. So, question is, yeah, how to deal with natural language processing? Um, and uh, I mean, I'm not Italian, but I'm, I'm doing it, you know, like using the hands language. So. Well, and uh, natural language processing has seen a recent increase in both um, uh, interest in research and specifically with network security research uh, has taken advantage of that in works like IP2VEC, Dante, DarkVEC, and so on. So we thought, what about, you know, how about applying such techniques to DDoS attack characterization? So um, this kind of untested on a realistic network uh, traffic traffic data set, so let's let's do it. Uh, with a big challenge that NLP approaches require uh, natural language corpora, uh, not flows. So we had to convert um, flow records from network traffic into into uh, like a kind of uh, text. So a corpus is a collection of sentences, paragraphs, and documents. And um, as we mentioned pre previously. Um, um, like a kind of previous work, uh, use sentences uh, like we use uh, documents. So to illustrate this, if you consider a set of uh, documents from Wikipedia, we have uh, like a bread, Pluto, flower, Jupiter, Earth, and wheat, and the words in each document. And how can we find similar articles? Well, we turn documents into an embedding, and which is a unified vector space. And then you can use a technique like doc to vec to analyze um, these, these documents. And then we see that they, uh, uh, through the vector, they, they are uh, clearly separated. So for flow corpus generation, there's no um, golden rule. There's no established strategy. So we were really exploring the space and it was a quite wide space. I mean, uh, you know, what to try, how to represent this. 
So, but the idea was, the goal was how to transform flow records into this vector space. So we need to first convert flow records into a document corpus, and the words in this corpus should describe flow level behavior and the patterns. And as I said, there's no standard uh, way of doing this. So we had a lot of uh, trial and error. We explored uh, uh, several different designs, over 20 different designs uh, to come up with the best. So to illustrate how this is done, consider this uh, flow record. We have um, timestamps, source IP address, destination IP address, and so on. And uh, number of packets, total number of bytes, and the protocol. So now we need to generate a behavior word. So the behavior word would be like a, if we rely on domain knowledge, this is not necessary, but like a, let's suppose we use domain knowledge, then uh, the question is uh, recognized or not. So consider the source port there, it's 11 to 11, that's um, uh, um, memcache amplification typically. Um, we also see that there were two packets and in total and the bytes in this flow and the bytes um, was um, like a, this, this is total, total size. So, um, and we see it's UDP. So in that case, we recognize this as a mem memcached amplification. Um, so there's, a, there's another uh, issue in, in, in creating this, this, uh, this corpus is, is that uh, we, we like uh, we need to generate a word indicating volume. I mean, how many times something happens or what's the packet size, which is this case. Again, we look at the number of packets and the total um, number of bytes in the, in, the, in the flows, in the flow record. And then we would have uh, different ways of um, expressing this as a word. It might be like uh, things, um, an interval like between 1,000 and 1,500 or 1,500 and uh, 1,100, 1,150. So let's suppose in this case we chose uh, anything greater than 255. So we have now two words and now generate four words. So for example, we could represent as in the top or like at the bottom looking at the source and destination uh, ports. So let's use the, the, the bottom one. Now um, we have these words and now we need to append to the target uh, document. So the, this is another key choice. Um, what is the title or what is the tag that we use in documents? So we decided to use the IP address of the potential, in this case, typically the potential um, target or victim. So uh, we add uh, the, the words to the, to, to the document. And so we would have like a many, many cases as we just uh, saw there. So as the flow records are analyzed, uh, we, we keep uh, adding them. So, so now we have, uh, we transformed the, the flow records and uh, we have them uh, uh, ready for input into an uh, NLP technique. So we compared different approaches for NLP, like word to vec doc to vec and LSA. And we end up using LSA, which was kind of super old and, and, and perhaps not the best, but it was simple. And uh, we, so we just, we, in, in, this, um, um, in this study, we, we, we stick with LSA right? because it performed the best and it was uh, super simple. So the characterization is a multi-label classification setup. So we have like a flow records and we want to, uh, see if um, there, there's some rules, like there, there's some uh, labels that um, are associated with the, those flow records. So the challenge is to uh, predict the IXP scrubber filtering rules that apply to the traffic de destined for a potential unseen victim address. So note that uh, we didn't use the IXP scrubber rules um, 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 in creating the, the flow corpus and so on. Uh, we use as a ground truth. So we want to see how good we are at predicting uh, those rules. So we use the five cross, five fold cross validation with uh, iterative stratification random shuffling, like making the folds similar. This is the overall process. 
Uh, as a classifier, we, 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 we uh, again adopted a very simple approach, which is uh, KNN with K equals 10. We, we tried XJ boost and stuff, but uh, we stick with the KNN. And as baselines, we we check to dot to vec, word to vec, and and counter to compare. These are not really really baselines, but like a, they 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 because they are not um, tailored to DDoS, but they provide the uh, comparison. So you, we look at uh, one month of XP flow samples that were chosen for the evaluation. Uh, note that this, there is extreme class table supporting balance. So there's some classes that uh, appear. Uh, they are supported a lot more. And also we create um, this uh, new uh, match label, which means that uh, this is kind of, it doesn't match any of the scrubber uh, rules. And we remove any any um, any that uh, case that do doesn't have at least 10 um, occurrences. So here's the like uh, how, how the data is distributed uh, with the no not being represented and all else. So this is the performance uh, results overall. Uh, we see in blue the best results. Um, um, there's two kinds of results mainly. There's macro average and micro, micro average. Uh, both are important. Uh, macro average um, 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 considers class imbalance. That's why like uh, it's robust against class imbalance. Those, those, those the performance is lower than micro average. But anyway, both both are important depending what you want. And um, overall, um, we see that the DDoS to VEC outperforms all baselines in classification performance, but it, it doesn't provide the best, uh, uh, the lowest running time. Um, it was quite striking that we thought that domain knowledge, by, by following dark VEC, we thought that domain knowledge was good, and then we find out that actually it wasn't so, so good. Um, so with no domain knowledge, we we actually uh, basically we we improved quite a lot processing time, uh, but that without sacrificing performance, actually the opposite, a little bit. And we also have a tuned version that is that is actually um, reduces from four four hours to to ten minutes, so it's quite a reduction. So we analyze the uh, how how does the perform uh, how does it perform across time. Um, to check the transferability be performance between different modes. So uh, we pick one mode in the middle and test uh, several modes before and several modes after. And then we see that there is a decrease and there is a decrease, and uh, but essentially it, um, it's robust to that. This is the time it takes. Um, um, so like this grows linearly. And to conclude the talk, um, the evaluation was limited to UDP-based volumetric DDoS attacks. Uh, we need a real data set with more labeled characteristics in general. Limited comparison to other approaches because we had nothing better to compare. And we are unaware of other possible multi-label classification baselines. Finally, behind the state of the art in NLP, uh, we need to improve quite a lot um, um, our use of NLP. Um, and uh, so this this Dr. Vec, Word to Vec LSA, they are at least uh, you know ten years old. Um, yeah, these are the key takeaway, key takeaways. But I'm I'm wasting my time. We're well, like a, over time. Thank you very much. Thank you, Ben. Questions. Thank you for your talk. Uh, that's a uh, very interesting work. Uh, so once you use uh, this kind of uh, NFP technology, did you think about uh, the speed of uh, your processing? I mean, especially for this uh, internet exchange uh, point, uh, there are a lot of huge uh, amount of uh, traffic. Uh, so how, how about uh, the speed of uh, processing? And uh, additionally, did you find any, maybe some kind of one-day, zero-day attack, or maybe some new kind of attacks? Thank you. Thank you for the question. Um, I'm not sure I understood correctly, but the, the first question was about processing time, right? So 
uh, to to train uh, normally kind of train an entire month of of flow records. It was quite a lot, like millions of destinations. It takes like a you know a few hours, and then we have uh, we have like a, a few minutes to um, then uh, to use that to test uh, to do the the, the, the multi label classification or what we call the characterization. Um, this is not a real time problem. Um, I think that's the question. Like uh, we we are not uh, um, aiming to operate at, at line rates. We are we, you you can regard this as perhaps as a forensics in terms of DDoS. So the attack happened. Uh, you capture the traffic, and now you want to understand what happened. So you can use this kind of technique, and you you have time to do so. So it is not a problem. And the second question was about um, 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 new attacks. Yes, um, so we are quite puzzled by the fact that the domain knowledge didn't help that much um, and they're still exploring this. Um, we, I, I, I don't have a concrete answer in terms of, uh, of new attacks. Well, this was 2019 anyway, so we are not really paying attention to new attacks. Thank you. So one question that I have, uh, because we've been working with a lot of the data sets that you said that aren't very good, but on the other hand, it appears that you didn't generate a label data set that others can use it. So what should you use for now? What's the best recommendation for people, for students that are doing research and trying to mitigate DDoS? Well, yeah, the, um, the the absence of data sets. I mean, uh, it's not good news, right? When you demonstrate that, that there's a there's a problem and you don't present a solution, it's not very nice. But um, but yes, like I would I would say that we have a general problem that we are trying to solve. There there is a group working on this, on how to share uh, um, uh, data for the DOS research. Uh, but um, um, I, that's the only thing I can I can mention now. Um, yes, um, perhaps we have hope to collect data. You know that we have this problem. Uh, sorry, I don't. I don't, know. I, I don't have positive words to say unless think twice uh, before using uh, these data sets because uh, your results will not be like uh, robust. Any other questions? Oh, yeah. Um, since you started exploring the NLP um, domain, do you see a slightly tangential um, uh, question here? Do you see the generative part of NLP being helpful towards creating these data sets um, in a simulated manner? Thank you for the question. Um, if I understood, um, you you are asking about the use of uh, generative AI for for this problem, or generating the the data sets that you were talking about. Oh yes, absolutely. Yes, in fact, that is being explored. Uh, I I um, I've heard people are uh, who are ex who are exploring this also. But I mean, yeah, like using generative uh, to um, it's 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 an artificial data set. But uh, perhaps uh, better than we than we have now. Yes, I, I think it's a good approach. Uh, I, I, I mean, you have to try. Then there's a question: How do you validate that you generated a good data set? Uh, that's a big problem. Thank you. Thank you. Okay, let's thank Marino again.